Gentlemen, we are about to begin. Can we please stand for the national anthem, please? Thank you very much. You may be seated. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure on behalf of the University of the West Indies to welcome you all to this important function this evening, honoring our past principal, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, former Governor General and Principal Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. And we are honoring him by naming in his honor uh, the administrative building for which he was so instrumental in getting it up. It's going to be called the Kenneth Hall Administrative Complex. Please let us give a round of applause to our honorary this evening. And we are not celebrating bricks and stone, ladies and gentlemen, but we are celebrating a career that has been dedicated to regional development, to regional integration to the great University of the West Indies. I think Professor Hall has the distinction of being the only principal in the last 30 years to serve two full two terms here at the University of the West Indies. And as somebody who has been here in a minor position over the last four years, that takes a lot of tenacity <laughs> A lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, and I hope that um, he would have set a trend, certainly and an inspiration for our current principal, who has just taken on the mantle. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure this afternoon to welcome, and please bear with me as I go through the long list of dignitaries who are here to celebrate with Sir Kenneth and it is befitting that he has drawn so many people from so many different eras in the life of this country and our society. First of all I want to welcome on the platform our guest of honor Sir Kenneth and Lady Hall. A round of applause for them please. I want to welcome our guest speaker, 
Dr. The Honorable Peter Phillips, who is no stranger to these parts. A round of applause for Dr. Phillips, please. The Minister of State and the Minister of Education and Youth, Honorable Marsha Smith. Our own Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Denzel Williams. We're happy to have celebrating with us this afternoon former Prime Minister, Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, Opposition Leader, Honorable Mark Golden, and we have a number of past ministers who have contributed significantly to the University of the West Indies perhaps not only as a lecturer, but as influencers in the society. I'm talking about former Minister of Finance and lecturer here, senior lecturer at the university, Dr. Omar Davies, who is here with us. And from our university management, we have all our Dean's here. We have our bursar, which is Ketrick Park Tweets. That is our work up to you. <laughs> and from our retirees, people whose shoulders we still stand on, we are very pleased to welcome two former deputy principals, Professor Marlin Hamilton and Mr. Joe Pereira. Three, actually, and Professor Hian Boxil. <laughs> want to welcome former University Bursa, Dr. Archibald Campbell, <laughs> and anybody know anything about the university really knows who run things. Former campus registrar who work alongside Professor Kenneth Hall, my illustrious predecessor, Mr. Anthony Falloon. <laughs> and we have a great cloud of witnesses here this afternoon. <laughs> Too many for me to mention. So welcome everybody, and um, we're going to get down into the program. Just to mention that we are doing this today within the context of our 75th anniversary and it is really fitting for those who have served us and whose shoulders we stand, who have labored intellectually and otherwise to build this great university and given us the kind of repetition and statue that we now have, that we celebrate them. And this morning we open another facility and name it after one Sir Kenneth Standard, which is the August Stone Community Clinic. And the principal made mention that today is really Kenneth's day. <laughs> From Kenneth Standard to Kenneth Hall. And we are very happy also to have student representative, Ms. Amal Amalora Wilson, our guild president, please. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we move right down into the program. So we'll start off by asking <coughs> our principal who is host, uh, Prof. Denzel Williams, to come forward and make some remarks. Principal. Thank you very much, our illustrious and elusive campus registrar. Mr. Dr. Donovan Stanberry. Uh, Prime Minister Patterson, you know, I didn't know that someone could break the law and still become Governor General. Because I started reading this program 
And it said to me here that Professor Kenneth Hall has a remarkable career spanning over four decades. And I looked at the man and I said to myself, if you look like 40 and you have a career spanning four decades, it means that you're actually engaged in child labor. <laughs> so Sir Ken, I'm not sure what happened there, but good genes. Good genes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me this evening recognize Prime Minister Patterson. Let me recognize Minister Smith, uh, Opposition Leader Golding, dignitaries from all over, uh, from the former, uh, former colleagues of Professor Hall, members of the diplomatic corps, members of the business sector, executives of the university, members of the clergy, and most importantly, our celebrant this evening, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall and Lady Hall. Greetings, as my program says to me this evening that I should say. It says I should say, welcome, and these are my remarks, and I should sit down. <laughs> but then it struck me that in the presence of a former principal, you really cannot do that in an academic context. And so you have to say something else. And any good professor knows that every instruction that you get, you actually interpret it the way you want, and you answer the question that the way you feel. And so today, I think it is worthwhile for us to acknowledge and celebrate the work of Sir Kenneth Hall. He's a tremendous figure in the academic life of our institution, of the Caribbean region, and more so global academia. He's a visionary, but not just being visionary, he's a practical visionary. And he was able to balance vision and action in order to accomplish results. And so today we want to celebrate him for that. It's a very rare characteristic. And for him to actually have displayed it, we should say heartiest congratulations to Sir Ken. But importantly, there is a broader context to Sir Ken's work and Sir Ken's vision, in my view. And it draws me back to Peter Evans, who has a still fairly underdeveloped concept called embedded autonomy. But despite the underdevelopment of the concept from a very academic perspective, he made, in my view, a very germane observation. And this is what Peter Evans said. He said that in order for countries to progress economically, institutional design plays a strong role in the success of most transition economies. So that was Peter Evans. But to pick up on that work, Peter Blair Henry, a Jamaican economist, I think he's now at Yale, and Conrad Miller also made similar observations in a piece entitled Institutions versus Policy. They also showed that strong institutions are what matter for economic transformation and transition. So if we accept those facts, then we can conclude that Hall's vision as an institution builder did not happen by accident, but was well carved out and deliberate as he has a penchant for making the lives of people better and the people he served better. So today, we celebrate an institution builder who not only saw it fit to advance the mission and vision of this university by ensuring that that mission and vision is not just a fancy or something that goes with the wind, but it has institutional memory and institutional arrangements. And so today what we are celebrating is a visionary who recognized that for institutions and visions to last, that they must have an institutional structure behind them. 
Today, we want to celebrate the dedication of this UWI man. Today, we want to celebrate a good citizen of the Caribbean, a committed regionalist. And today, we want to celebrate our friend, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall. So, Prof Hall, thanks for not only being a visionary, but being a practical one as well, that was able to balance vision and action. We celebrate you and we look forward to continuing to depend on your wisdom as we build out our institutional architecture to support the legacy of our UWI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Principal. Allow me to tender apologies um, on behalf of His Excellency, the Governor General, Sir Patrick Allen, Allen, rather, who has written to me personally to express his regret at not being able to be here, and Sir Kenneth to pass on to you his best wishes. Um, our esteemed Vice Chancellor Beckles, who is unavoidably absent traveling, and three former principals, Weber, McDonald, and Gordon Shirley, who similarly uh, tender apologies. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning we had at the other function uh, the Minister of Education, who is also the MP for this era, and she celebrated with us Sir Kenneth Standard when we named that building after him this morning. She couldn't make it twice in one day, having regard to her other commitments. But she has sent the Honorable Marsha Smith, who is representing her here today. And um, Honorable Smith, I'm struck by your humility. Because when we were looking for her to drive up with her driver, she just simply walked in. And I admire that so much about a minister. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Honorable Marsha Simit. Good evening all, and thank you, Dr. Stanberry, for the welcome to the podium to share in such a momentous occasion today. The most honorable Pro Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, our former Governor General and former Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the UE Mona campus and Lady Hall, our former Prime Minister, the most honorable PJ Patterson, our leader of opposition, Mr. Mark Golden, former Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Omar Davis, Professor Denzel Williams, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the UA Mona campus, other representatives of the University of the West Indies, faculty, staff, and students, our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Peter Phillips, Member of Parliament, St. Andrew East Central, members of the Diplomatic Corps and clergy, civic society, ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great pleasure to participate in today's renaming ceremony that honors the work and contribution of the most honorable Sir Kenneth Hall to the development of the University of the West Indies Mona campus. And I would like to think that within the UE family that there is a feeling that the Mona campus is the most important campus. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the particular focus on ensuring that Sir Kenneth Hall's work is celebrated during the 75th anniversary of the university is extremely special and quite meaningful, I believe, to Sir Kenneth Hall himself and his family. It is a very fitting tribute. Sir Kenneth Hall's work has been outstanding. He has done a lot to improve the administrative services across the campus, including the establishment of the Annex Building as a centralized human resource complex 
and being renamed in his honor is quite fitting. The UA staff and student complement has grown over the years, and with that growth has come the demand for a more extensive and expansive administrative operation. And under the guidance and visionary leadership of Sir Kenneth Hall, when he was principal, he ensured that there was an expansion in the use and the integration of information communication technologies to modernize the institution's operations. And the value to the institution for those works cannot be overstated. Sir Kenneth Hall has been an integral part of the UAE as a regional institution over many decades. And his transformative leadership has led to an increased student access, continued teaching and curriculum reform, improvement of the teaching learning environment, research, innovation in governance, among other things. His leadership, vision, and dedication have helped to make the university a better place for students, faculty, and staff alike. As we honor Sir Kenneth Hall today, we are reminded of the importance of committed leadership and vision. We are grateful for all that you have done, Sir Kenneth Hall, for our university. Currently, as we focus the nation's attention on transforming education for national development, we can draw inspiration from your commitment to excellence and hard work. The efforts to increase access and to reform the campus programs and to make them more relevant to contemporary needs continue. Highest commendations to the UE family for this excellent decision to honor the legacy of Sir Kenneth Hall and his legacy in particular to the Mona campus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for your support and that of the Ministry of Education. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I also want to welcome the Anglican Bishop of Jamaica, and I think the West Indies, Archbishop, the Robert Gregory. Welcome, sir. Howard, sorry. When you see Robert again, tell him I've just sanctified him. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my task to give a brief overview of how this building came into being and Sir Kenneth's unique role and pioneering role in having the design and construction of the administrative complex. The University of the West Indies for at least its last three strategic plans, five-year plans, and certainly before we started strategic plans, has always put a premium on student-centeredness. After all, our students is why we exist. And also, the value of our staff, our human resources, as I've always said, this is not a factory that deals with raw material and that kind of thing. Our resource is human capital. And so it is important that we keep our staff happy and motivated, even as we want them to be accountable and give off their best. So, as you all know, we started in a small building 33 years ago, and we have evolved since. And this vast compound comprising over 600 acres. And there was a time when different elements of administration were scattered all over the campus. I gather personnel as it was then, was done by credit union, HR, 
did not sit as a unit together, but different elements was all over campus. And uh, no university that values student-centeredness and values staff and puts a premium on efficient operation and good customer service could continue in that vein. And so, Sir Kenneth, even against the background of our tight financial situation, and those of us who are here now would know that that situation has lasted for a while. It's not just a thing of yesterday. It was determined that all of the administrative elements of the campus must be situated under one cover. I, for instance, am a beneficiary of that. And I'm extremely glad because whilst I subscribe to physical fitness, <laughs> there is no way I would have wanted to be walking four times a day down to personnel to see my director of HR and then elsewhere. So what was done was to build this complex. I don't know why we call it annex, because when we call it annex, we really reducing it to an appendage because this is the center and the nerve, the nerve center of cooperation and put it all together. And those of us who sit there now, we are in fact the beneficiary to have a fully outfitted HR in one place, bursary, student affairs, secretariat, campus records management, etc in one place so that our students could be served in comfortable surroundings. Our staff could be together and work together in a very integrated way. Ladies and gentlemen, that was no small feat to put together, as simple as it sounds, all those elements in one place. And as I said before, I'm extremely grateful to Sir Ken and I also want to thank Mr. Falloon because I know that when principals come with big ideas, we are the one who have the headache to make it happen. So give Mr. Falloon a hand, please. So from I came here, Principal Weber has been very anxious to have this complex um, named after uh, Sir Kenneth Hall. And we all felt bad that it took us so long. But, uh, you know, despite the fact that probably Sir Kenneth Hall has more things named after him than any other principal, because it is said that every Hall of Residence, in effect, <laughs> is named after Sir Kenneth Hall. But then he also shared that with the mal inhabitants of this world and the other people who the odds are named after. So we decided that we are going to name this complex from him. So the university is a very complicated organization and few people understand the governance structure that we have at different levels at campus and when it start at faculty board and academic board and F and GPC, then it goes over to regional headquarters, but we were determined and we passed that resolution at every single stage of our governance system and at every stage it was unanimously endorsed that this building should be named after Sir Kenneth Hall. And we are very happy that it is happening within our 75th anniversary and I think that that is the best time to do it when all attention is being focused on the work of our pioneers and those people who have worked so hard to make this university what it is today. So thank you, Sir Ken, and we are very happy to do this today. And many of us are inspired by your work. And many of us who are now serving want to be inspired by you so that in time to come, principal, I'm not claiming in building, I just want to look at conference room. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because I don't have anything named after me except my son. So. <laughs>
So that's why we are here today, ladies and gentlemen. And at this time, I'm going to call on our guild president, Ms. Amalora Wilson, uh, to come forward and introduce our guest speaker, Dr. the Honorable Peter Phillips. Let us hear it for Amalora, please. All right, I have a very long um, acknowledgement as well. So bear with me before we go into the actual introduction of the guest speaker. The most honorable professor, Sir Kenneth Octavius Hall and Lady Hall, Dr. Donovan Stanbury, our campus registrar, Professor Denzel Williams, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the UE Mona, Honorable Marcia Smith, Minister of State in the Ministry of Education and Youth, Dr. Peter Phillips, Member of Parliament and former Leader of Opposition, Members of Senior Administration, Members of Staff, Lecturers and Deans, our retirees and alumni, Members of Political Parties, Specially Invited Guests, My Pelicans, and to all ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Omolora Wilson, and as the UE Mona Guild President, it is my esteemed privilege to introduce to you Dr. Peter David Phillips, a luminary figure in both parliamentary and academic spheres. Dr. Phillips, born amidst the picturesque landscape of Manchester Parish, traversed a scholarly trajectory that spans continents and accolades. His formative years in the United Kingdom, coupled with academic pursuits at Jamaica College and the University of the West Indies, of course, um, culminated in the attainment of a Bachelor's of Science in Economics and a Master's degree, Master of Science rather, in Government. As a Ford Foundation Fellow, he undertook doctoral studies at the State University of New York at Binghamton, specializing in international political economy, and further enriched his intellectual pursuits as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Florida at Gainesville. Distinguished guests, Dr. Phillips' commitment to scholarly excellence seamlessly transitioned into a noteworthy tenure in academia, preceding his entry into the hallowed halls of parliament. Hmm. A dedicated public servant, he commenced his parliamentary journey as an appointed senator after the People's National Party's triumph in the 1989 general elections. Subsequently, assuming pivotal roles, including Minister of State in the office of the Prime Minister, PMP's General Secretary, and Minister of Special Projects, Dr. Phillips showcased unparalleled acumen and dedication. His parliamentary odyssey continued with resounding success, representing the constituency of St. Andrew East Central from 1994 until his resignation in 2020. Are you still right here? Still right here? Are we still moving? Love to hear it. All right. <laughs> Noteworthy ministerial appointments, such as Minister of Health and later Minister of Transport and Works, underscored his versatile and impactful contributions earning the mantle of the vice president of the PNP in 1999, which just spanned him time He ascended to a greater responsibilities, steering the ship as the Minister of National Security and following the party's 2011 electoral victory, assuming the pivotal roles of Minister of Finance and Public Service, along with Deputy Prime Minister. Dr. Phillips' leadership reached its zenith when, post the 2016 national elections, he assumed the mantle of leader of, peoples, of the People's National Party and leader of the opposition until his resignation in 2020. His indelible mark on Jamaica's political landscape includes triumphs in 
curbing Ill illegal narcotic flows, orchestrating a transformative reform for Jamaica's security force, and spearheading substantial improvements in the corporate area's transport system and the nation's road network. In the pantheon of distinguished statemanship, Dr. Peter David Phillips stands as a paragon of excellence, embodying the nexus between erudition and public service. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in extending a warm welcome to a luminary whose legacy continues to resonate across the realms of government, politics, and academia. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Peter David Phillips. certain Mark would have been concerned about having to fight this by-election now. <laughs> let me, let me, I, let me first of all recognize our guest of honor, Professor, the most honorable Sir Kenneth Hall and Lady Hall, the principal and pro-vice chancellor, Professor Denzel, I almost said Denzel, Douglas. <laughs> so that the UWI student here. I would like to recognize also the most honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Honorable Minister Marshall Smith, Honorable Mark Golding, Leader of the Opposition, Distinguished Registrar, colleague, former Minister Omar Davis, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen all, forgive me, I don't propose to attempt to list all the luminaries here this afternoon. It is indeed a pleasure to be here and to address you because speaking very, very frankly, I consider myself literally a child of this campus. Having lived here, studied and lectured on this campus since I was about 10 years old. Living, but not lecturing. <laughs> one, of, one, one of the campus, campus children, so to speak, my father having been in the, what was then the Department of Education. And despite the fact that I took what I thought was going to be a short leave of absence in 1989, it turned out to be about 34 years. I'm always pleased to be on the Mona campus and I thank you for the honor that you bestow on me by inviting me to address you this evening. My sense of privilege and honor is immeasurably greater, however, in view of the fact that this ceremony is dedicated to Professor the Most Honorable Sir Kenneth Hall. We are all gathered here not only to name a building in his honor, but to express the deep and abiding appreciation that we feel as a generation regarding his contribution to the University of the West Indies to Jamaica, and to the Caribbean region as a whole. Kenneth Octavius Hall hails from the parish of Hanover and attended Rossi's High School. I suppose, however, the fact that his parents chose to name him Octavius <laughs> certifies that they had some inkling of the fact that, like Gaius Octavius, the first emperor of Rome, he would form empires in the course of his life. <laughs> in truth, 
From those rural beginnings, Sir Kenneth's reach has been extensive. Like so many of us, he entered UWI in 1966 to read history. And in, and in a sense, it seems as if he never left, despite having taken a sojourn to complete his postgraduate studies at Queen's University in Ontario, and having spent time at the State University of New York as an administrator and academic, his heart was always in the Caribbean, to which he returned in the 1990s to serve as Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM. And I think it's appropriate to recognize that one of the defining features of Ken Hall's life has been his irrevocable commitment to the idea of regional integration of the Caribbean. And he has devoted himself to it, to the region, and indeed one of the hallmark, no pun intended, one of the hallmark projects of, of, of his tenure at the university was the CARICOM UWI project, which initiated perhaps the most extensive infrastructural expansion that has taken place at the University of the West Indies and extended its reach across the Caribbean, particularly incorporating the so-called uh, OECD, con OECS countries. After leaving CARICOM, however, he found his way back, as he had been programmed to do, to the Mona campus, taking up an appointment as Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, serving for 10 years. The Mona campus thus served as perhaps the first of his empires anticipated by his parents. That is, until he was selected to be Governor General of Jamaica in 1996 and took control of the country. <laughs> the building that we're naming today highlights for me what is perhaps the most significant contribution of Ken Hall to the university, namely the establishment and sustenance of a philosophy of student-centeredness in the operations of the university. As, as, a, as, a, as a young student, I, I think it is fair to say I had no idea that we were at the center of the administration's preoccupations. As a consequence, we found it necessary to rebel a lot. But one of the more welcome changes that has occurred over the years, spearheaded by Ken Hall in a very definitive way, has been the notion that the student ought to be at the center of all that is being done at the university. And it is a very, very important contrast, if I'd be permitted an anecdote. I believe upstairs, there used to be a little cashier's cage. <laughs> and when the university had money for you, as a student, you would go, perhaps, they would tell you to come at 11 o'clock. If it wasn't ready, they said, come back at 2 o'clock. If that wasn't ready, they said, come back tomorrow morning. And you could be going for a week or more. And it was very off-putting. I contrasted that to something that happened to me when, when I was at... State University of New York as a 
graduate student. The university had money for me and uh, I, it usually would come like clockwork. One day in the four years it didn't come and the entire university administration came out to apologize to me, lowly graduate student, for the fact that it was late. And I think I mentioned the anecdote to highlight the difference between student centeredness and um, the student as an appendage to the operations of an institution. And I, I wouldn't claim that the, the, the commitment to student centeredness that Ken developed was a result of his serving overseas. But what I do know is that it is a reflection of the basic decency and goodwill that he has always manifested in his life, in his dealing towards all and sundry. And he was willing to bring this innate decency and, and sense of recognition of the worth of each individual into his administrative endeavors at the University of the West Indies. And I believe that it is important that we emphasize this principle that he has brought and to the university and underpinned in the operations of the university. We all owe him a debt of gratitude for that and I'm certain that generations of students will want to remember his name and therefore it's most appropriate that we are naming this building in his honor this evening. The occasion, however, does give us an opportunity to take stock of this beloved institution of ours against the backdrop not just of its 75 years of existence, but against the backdrop also of the current challenges facing our country and Caribbean nationhood in general. The idea of this university, I think it is true to say, was born out of the crucible of the struggles of the Caribbean people highlighted by the labor rebellions of the 1930s and the, the agitation for democratic rights which took place in the 1940s and 50s and which set Jamaica and other countries of the Caribbean ineluctably on the path to naturehood. Out of these struggles, the University of the West Indies emerged as an essential institutional underpinning of Caribbean nationhood. It was emblematic, the university was, was emblematic of our embrace of modernity as a region and our commitment to the progressive development of all our peoples. In that sense, the key element of the social contract linking the university to society was the commitment of the university to provide steadily expanding, expanding access to undergraduate education and to the enablement of the professional development of the Caribbean peoples. It was a relatively simple, simple paradigm, fit for purpose in an essentially, in the essentially predictable world of those times. The Caribbean was part of a group of so-called new states which were expected to move forward as part of the new world, free world, as it was called, which emerged as a consequence of the dismemberment of Europe's overseas empires. In the context of a US-centered world order bolstered by investment flows mainly from the United States, social rights would expand and liberal democracy was to be consolidated. The university was financed in its entirety 
by the government and the Ministry of Finance and student costs were relatively affordable in the context of a rapidly growing economy of those times. And I mean, I can speak feelingly about the, 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 the nature of student incomes at the time because at the soda fountain, as it was called then, which is where the bank is now, without working anywhere, it was possible to go and buy a box of beer to sit with your friends on a Friday afternoon and enjoy the reflections and the lectures that had gone before during the week. With some adjustment, <laughs> with some adjustment, relatively minor adjustments, I would suggest. This is the implicit contract between the university and society as it stands today. Although more space has been given to postgraduate studies and research, it is still essentially a teaching university as distinct from a research-centered university, and it is still almost entirely dependent on payments from the Ministry of Finance, inadequate, though those have been over many decades. I can confirm the inadequacy of it, and I'm certain Omar can, concern, can confirm also that despite our, <laughs> despite, despite our best wishes and hopes, it has not been possible to provide from the public purse the level of resources needed to provide for a first-rate modern university. Make no doubt about it. The question that arises now is whether the current social contract that exists between the university and the society and the assumptions that underlie it can be sustained in the current period. The optimism that surrounded the Caribbean's future in the immediate pre- and post-independence years has disappeared and has been replaced, if not by pessimism, at least by mounting and substantial doubt. The global order that existed in the decades since 1945 is under the most severe threat. As a result, there is an increase in the number and tempo of conflicts globally Reaching, reaching now into our region, the Venezuela-Guyana dispute stands as a case in point. More disturbingly, what appeared to be an established linkage between economic liberalism and democracy in the world is being ruptured as authoritarian political movements are capturing the heartlands of democracy in the United States and Europe, and I dare say, as a, as a region peopled by, mainly by peoples of African and Asian descent, we are seeing a reemergence of racist doctrines in these heartland countries of the world economy as well. Add to that new existential threats like climate change which are occurring simultaneous with a general retreat from the doctrine of developmentalism, which typified the world in the early post-war decades. We can see all of this amounting to a tremendous threat to the well-being of countries such as ours, which have become increasingly indebted and are suffering from low growth, declining investments, 
and should the challenges of climate change continue unchecked. And in the face of a reality where despite all the expressed commitments to resources for the benefit of small island developing states, these resources have not been forthcoming in anything like the amounts that are going to be necessary. We can see how imminent the threats to our future are. Climate catastrophe, for example, would wipe out the tourist-based economies of the Caribbean. Moreover, decades of high public debt and underinvestment in social infrastructure have left us reeling as a society from high crime and as Howard Mitchell recently warned us in remarks made at the PSOJ award function, we have been left also without a functioning set of values, functional set of values and attitudes, and without a clear-cut sense of national identity akin to that which existed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. What I'm suggesting very directly is that the time has come for us collectively as a society to re-examine the nature of the social contract between the University of the West Indies and the society. This process must of necessity be led by the university, but requires the deliberate engagement of all stakeholders in the various social sectors of the country. There are many considerations to take into account by way of background. For example, what is the relevance and significance of the fact that there are now many more degree granting institutions in existence in the country today providing professional certification? This was not the case three or even two decades ago. Today I'm told that there are some 20 odd degree granting institutions certified in the country. What implication does this have for the UWI's vision of itself as being open to all or should there be some adjustment to that vision? Furthermore, what is the significance of the fact that an increasing number of our best students are being recruited straight from high school to foreign campuses. This is a relatively recent development, but it does have implications for our sense of national identity and for our collective vision of ourselves as a country, as some of our best students get sloughed off to other clans, many of whom never return. When I was leaving Jamaica College, it was what, probably 50 years, 50 odd years ago, I thought of one university. I came and took an exam down there and came to UWI as a student. Now, recruiters from American universities are visiting our high schools, in fact, directly offering all kinds of blandishments for our students to go elsewhere. From another vantage point, it has been clear to all who wish to observe that the fiscal circumstances of the Jamaican state and other Caribbean states have changed. Equally, the financial circumstances of the population have changed. Even with the currently declining debt-to-GDP ratios in Jamaica, there is no real prospect in the immediate future of adequate financing from the Consolidated Fund to meet all the legitimate demands of a first-rate modern university. While I'm aware that some discussions are underway, I've been spearheaded by the principal regarding the development of 
new funding models. These discussions thus far have been inconclusive and need to be energized and the problem faced squarely. In turn, the fiscal problems which confront the Jamaican state are at least in part a reflection of the contemporary complexities and stringencies of the regional and global environment in which we operate. Policy making is taking place today in much more difficult circumstances than was the case in the past. For the most part, however, there is little policy-focused research available from the institution. I can personally testify again, having held four important relatively ministerial portfolios over the past 30 years, it was rare that there was any serious policy reflections available. The time perhaps has come for us to consider uh, sponsored research and for the development of more research institutions in line with the Kennedy School at Harvard, for example, or the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, focused entirely in their society on the problems of society and governance. We, in circumstances much more stringent and difficult, are certainly in need of these supports in our country. I could go on, but I'm not attempting here to be exhaustive. Rather, my purpose is simply to highlight some of the changes which, when taken together, and ve constitute a real challenge to the state, and indeed an existential challenge to the society. As is evident, however, in the celebration of the contribution of Sir Kenneth Hall this evening, Effective foundations have been laid at the University of the West Indies. History is now placing before us a fresh set of challenges to be confronted and overcome. New pioneers are being summoned. Fortunately, they can go forward bolstered and inspired by the accomplishments and example of people like Ken Hall who led the generations before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Phillips. Very heavy and profound stuff and much to think about. And um, I think Dr. Phillips might have reignited a debate that we have to keep alive in terms of the social contract, uh, the contract between the university and society and how we are funded. So we'll think about that and just to ease up some of those heavy and profound and deep things. We're going to have Rene Rochelle Daly, a member of the university, the acclaimed university singers, who will entertain us um, at this juncture. Please give her a hand. Good evening, everyone. I must say you all look very lovely. Right. I am here to entertain you with two items, right? and I will just go straight into them. It's been a lot of talking. I'll just sing. Right. You've broken down and tired.
song is completely about feeling good in the moment and I hope that this is how we feel and it's a reflection of what's happening here. Um, whenever you're ready, please. Birds flying high You know how I feel Sun in the sky know how I feel, breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel, it's a new day, and I'm feeling
Dragonflies out in the sun That's what I mean, don't you know? Butterflies all having fun That's what I mean Sleep in peace till the day is done That's what I mean This old world is a new world And a bold world And I'm feeling good Stars, when you shine You Thank you. Thank you very much, Rochelle. You don't think she deserves a little better than that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite the platform party to, um, sorry to trouble you again, to um, descend from this lofty height and um, sit in the front to view a section of a documentary we did as part of our 75th anniversary celebrating our past principal and we're going to show you a short video of that segment devoted to Sir Kenneth Octavius Hall. So please give a round of applause while we, we move down. Sir Kenneth Octavius Hall was born in Lucy, Jamaica and attended Ruffees High School. Sir Kenneth Hall is a man with a long distinguished career in education. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from the UWI Mona campus, a postgraduate degree from Trinidad, and a master's of arts degree and a doctor of philosophy degree in history from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. In 1996, Professor Hall was appointed Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the UWI Mona Campus. During his 10 years at the helm of the campus, the policies that he implemented resulted in significant transformation in academic programs, physical infrastructure, and in student relations on the campus. Professor Hall is one who um who started what he what 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 he called the strategic transformation of the campus? He, he, he established a strategic transformation team, which I think did excellent work in in outlining and 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 charting the way forward for the campus. I I do give a lot of credit to Professor Hall for the changes which. He, he was able to um, undertake during that period of, of great transformation and increasing numbers of students. Another initiative that Professor Hall started at uh, the Mona campus was Research Day. If I'm not mistaken, the first one was in 1999. And uh, 
it was a way of showcasing the work that the universe, the campus, the Mona campus, the departments, uh, the centers, the units. Uh. Sir Kenneth Hall, subsequently Governor General Sir Kenneth Hall, was a mentor to me in many ways from before I became principal, when I was uh, the executive director at the Mona School of Business, I had a very close working relationship with Sir Ken, and I learned a lot from him. Professor Hall, calm, stable leadership. Even in the midst of turmoil, he was always very quiet, very calm, and very focused on what he had to do. Sir Kenneth Hall, recognizing the, the need to improve on the administrative operations. He had many of his um, sections and administrative departments in varying areas, and he recognized that having them in a central location would be certainly ideal to improve on the operational efficiencies. And as a result of that, that is how the admin annex building was developed. On February the 15th, 2006, Professor Kenneth Hall became Jamaica's fifth Governor General. Professor Hall brings to his post of Governor General extensive academic, administrative, and professional experience. His Excellency also has to his credit several books, articles, and papers. His publications include The Caribbean Community Beyond Survival, Caribbean Imperatives, Regional Governor, Contending with Destiny, The Caribbean in the 21st century, Integrate or Perish, Perspectives of Leaders of the Integration Movement, and Rex, Rex Nettleford, Selected Speeches. Sir Kenneth's journey has been one of unwavering dedication to service, diplomacy, and excellence. He reminds us that greatness is not only measured in titles and accolades, but in the profound impact one has on the lives of others. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a five-minute snippet of the contribution of Sir Kenneth Hall. And I don't think that I should really um, worry the platform party to come back up here since we are winding down. But um, it's time now to do the formal citation um, for Sir Kenneth before we have his response and then we go to the unveiling of the sign um, for the building. So it is my great pleasure at this time to invite Dr. Sonia Stanley Nair, a senior lecturer of cultural studies and deputy dean in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Uh, to come forward and read the citation. Perhaps we should um, ask Sir Senator Kenneth to come along while it is being read. Thank you very much. Distinguished honoree, Professor, the most honorable Kenneth, Sir Kenneth Hall. Yes, the lights are really bright in our eyes. <laughs> I stand here uh, as a child of Hanover, as one who is a child 
of service to this university, to this region, to this country. And I am really, I don't know about you, but I feel really very good. This occasion is one that really warms my heart and I hope that you all feel the same way. All protocols observed. I want to go straight into the citation. In recognition of his distinguished service and commitment to education, the University of the West Indies proudly honors the most honorable Professor Sir Kenneth Hall. Having served as the esteemed Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University's Mona campus for 10 transformative years from August 1996 to 2006, Sir Kenneth Hall was appointed Jamaica's fifth Governor General. Sir Kenneth Hall has left an indelible mark on the academic landscape, exemplifying excellence, leadership, and a steadfast dedication to the pursuit of knowledge. Professor Sir Kenneth Hall's legacy is etched in the very foundations of this institution. The most honorable Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, O.N., G.C., M.G., O.J., not only distinguished himself as a scholar, but has played pivotal roles in influencing the trajectory of academic and administrative excellence. He graduated from the University of the West Indies Mona campus in 1966 with a degree in history and furthered his education with a postgraduate diploma from the Institute of International Relations at the UWI's St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. Starting his professional career at the University of the West Indies as a teaching assistant at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, 1966 to 1967, Professor Hall subsequently served as lecturer in history at the Mona campus from 1972 to 1973. After exploring various professional academic pursuits outside of Jamaica, his return to the Caribbean in 1994 marked a crucial moment in the history of our beloved institution. Upon his return, Professor Hall assumed the role of Deputy Secretary General of CARICOM, dedicating two years to matters of regional integration. Later, Sir Kenneth successfully forged close ties with CARICOM through the UWI CARICOM Institutional Cooperation Project, showcasing his impactful influence on the institution and its broader regional connections. Sir Kenneth Hall's tenure was marked by a resolute commitment to repositioning the university on the global stage and solidifying its role as a key leader of positive change in the Caribbean region and beyond. Sir Kenneth Hall's visionary leadership has been a significant force in shaping the intellectual and cultural legacy of the university. He has cultivated an environment characterized by academic rigor, inclusivity, and innovation. His relentless dedication in advancing education and promoting a spirit of collaboration have left an enduring impact on the institution and the countless individuals whose lives have been touched by his mentorship. Governance practices fostering a culture of collaboration and efficiency within the institution. Sir Kenneth was unwavering in prioritizing and elevating research activities, thereby enriching the intellectual vibrancy of the university. The impact of UWI's research was viewed in a new light, extending beyond academia, influencing government policies, driving innovation in businesses, and playing a pivotal role in fostering economic growth, societal development, social progress, and catalyzing national and regional initiatives. Prioritizing a student-centered approach, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall addressed student well-being and success, leading to improved student relations and the creation of a more nurturing and supportive learning environment. He led the charge in advancing continued teaching and curriculum reform by introducing innovative teaching approaches and redesigning the curriculum. His efforts were dedicated to ensuring that the University of the West Indies Mona campus 
remained at the for forefront of academic excellence. Sir Kenneth Hall's policies and initiatives are evident in the substantial transformation of not only the academic programs, but also in staff development and technological advancement across faculties and administrative departments. The conceptualization and construction of the Annex Building stand as a testament to his visionary approach. This project stemmed from the recognition of the need for a centralized and integrated approach to enhance the management of the human resource environment at the Mona campus. Professor Sir Kenneth Hall's commitment to the University of the West Indies Mona campus went beyond his role as principal and included his service as the chairman of the board of directors of the Mona Institute of Business, now Mona School of Business and Management. He continues to be actively involved in this role as an honorary distinguished fellow. He has not really left the university at all. Sir Kenneth Hall is a highly accomplished author with a significant body of work, including numerous books and reviews on issues related to history and international relations. Today, as we inaugurate the Kenneth Hall Administration Building in his honor, we celebrate Professor Sir Kenneth Hall's remarkable decade-long tenure as Pro Vice Chancellor and Campus Principal, acknowledging his leadership in transforming the UWI Mona campus into a modern university. We honor a visionary leader whose legacy continues to shape the University of the West Indies Mona campus and inspire future generations. Be it resolved as we honor Professor Sir Kenneth Hall. Thank you, Dr. Um, Stanley. Stanley Nair, yes. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, may I now invite Principal Denzel Williams to present the citation to Sir Kenneth. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the man who we celebrate tonight, the most honorable, Professor Sir Kenneth Octavius Hall. A big round of applause for him, please. Thank you, Dr. Stanberg. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not often speechless, <laughs> having spent the, most of my life as a professor and being able to speak without notes. But let me acknowledge my indebtedness to the university for honoring me by putting my name on this building. Now, I prepared about three versions of my presentation. <laughs> and as the speakers went, so did the versions. <laughs> First, Dr. Stanberry, you wiped away all the explanations I could give for that building, and that was great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Phillips, my friend of long standing. Believe it, when I came to the university first as a lecturer, he was my dean. And you know, in those days when you're a junior lecturer, you speak only to the deputy deans. And Peter was the deputy dean. So we have had a long relationship. 
and you said everything that was in the second version of my speech. <laughs> and for that, too, I am indebted to you and thank you. Which leaves me pretty much with a document which um, has very little value except to say I also thought of those ideas as you read them. <laughs> but um, I suppose there was something that, some things that you left out. Not you, but you know, and the citation that was so beautifully done by my fellow Hanoverian, and there are quite a, f a few of us in this audience, and let me acknowledge them immediately. So, but uh, what, I, what I'm left with is an unprepared speech. And that speech, therefore, would be focused on simply one term. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. For all of you who came out this evening, um, Friday evening and Thursday evening, preparing for Friday and so on, but thank all of you. I have not said anything about the, I have not done the usual thing of salutations deliberately, because what I'd like to do is to use my time to thank all of those, to thank, not all, because this would take us two days, all of those people who contributed to what you have now told me was a successful tenure. That's not how I saw it, that's not how it started, but I am prepared to accept without question your judgments. <laughs> and this is kind of rare for me because as a contentious academic outside of my thing, I would normally say that I take issue with much of what has been said. <laughs> but, um, in keep, but in good faith, I have to acknowledge that some of it did cover things which I, I feel impressed, dedicated to. Now, there are, when I came to this campus, and this building in particular, I have a certain affection or terror. And like tonight, what you have done, you have terrorized me by putting me in this building again. But the origin of that building started then, my first week at this campus. I was on my way up to what was supposed to be my office. And as I got to the bottom of the stairs, I met a certain Professor Devonish. And he greeted me by saying, we don't care about you, essentially. We will meet you at the Ministry of Labor. Frankly, I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> but I thought it was a great way to welcome the new principal. And so I inquired and realized what was happening was that I was supposed to have led the negotiations for Wigot on the administrative side. And so that was my first greeting. Well, it, it went on, you know, and so I felt quite uncomfortable in this space. And thank goodness I had taken one person, invited one person to accompany me from Guyana Dr. Fong, and so the two of us, when we went to our offices in the morning, we were greeted with prayers of deliverance. <laughs> Literally, um, you know, there was a prayer meeting every morning as soon as we got to the door, and the idea was deliver us from these two people. <laughs> Luckily, we didn't take it personally, but it was intimidating, I have to admit. 
Nonetheless, that was, you know, the first start. In fact, the, my first question when I was interviewed for the job, and I'm sorry he's not here tonight, but there was a thing we used to call the torpedo question, which you reserve for the last in interviews. And that is when the person has answered every question to your satisfaction, you had the torpedo question, which destroyed everything that had happened. And the torpedo question was asked by the Minister of Education, who became my good friend afterwards, the Honorable Birchall Whiteman, Ambassador Whiteman. And the question was, how do you respond to the concept that the University of the West Indies is an intellectual ghetto? <laughs> now, imagine I didn't even know who the, because I have lived out at Jamaica for 30 years up to that point. And I, I had to walk, you know, you, you, and that was the first question. But I survived the interview for some reason, and so I was asked to take up the position, which I did with some trepidation, but the reason I survived was because I was the beneficiary of certain traits. Three persons in particular really shaped my approach to life, my mother, my paternal grandmother and my eldest sister in different ways. And what it was, I realize now, is that they allowed me to do more or less to be different, if you wish, to do things which you could do. Because my, I grew up in a family, as you can imagine, with a father who was extremely strict and terrorized all of us as kids. <laughs> and so on. He didn't have to do anything. That's just a frightening part. He just had to appear <laughs> and so on. So my mother had a way of doing it. She said, yes, you, you can afford to be different, but make sure that when you're different, I can defend you. <laughs> and so I grew up sort of fairly free to do anything I wanted, provided it was defensible to my mother and my paternal grandmother and later my eldest sister. So I'm the beneficiary of the guardianship and wisdom of these three ladies. And that, I think, served me well here because I quickly learned that it doesn't matter. I didn't come here to be liked or to be loved and to be popular. I had given up politics long ago, and so I did not need to campaign for anything. So I had to deal with people who fundamentally disagreed with anything you were doing. And what I relied then on was at some point, we could come to some agreement that this was all for the university and that I had nothing to do with it. So my ego was spared being attacked. And among those persons who made it possible to do so was one Mr. Joseph Pereira, who I think is in the audience. And what it was, it's a simple, th again, this building has certain memories for me. What it was, um, he was, curiously, he was either head or he has founded Wigat. And for Wigat at that time, administration was just the worst set of people in the world. <laughs> and that every opportunity should be taken 
to slam them. And I appreciated that, having been in a union myself and so on. But what changed all of that and what allowed me to survive was a letter from Superior, which he handed to me at the foot of the stairs again. <laughs> Joe sorted it out. Whenever there was something, you said, Joe, why aren't you? And you'd hang it, you know. Demonstrations of students, locked down the campus. He was himself a leader of the student movement. So you understood that. So when my good friend, um, now my good friend, uh, Mr. Crawford closed the gates <laughs> and threatened everything else and had us on, had the university in the news in such a way that I had to be re reminded that I should respond. But I did not re personally respond. I, Joe, <laughs> Joe had a pipeline to the leadership of the student body. And so we were able to meet, sorted it out. And Damian Crawford was the person I'm speaking about. And we became good friends after that. And I have come to admire him for several reasons. He was the only person I knew who made sense, or rather made nonsense, of the way the university was being funded. Because he went to the budget meeting at the ministry, Peter, single-handed, no briefs, nothing, sat in the meeting as a representative of the students and convinced the minister especially the bursa at the university, that the whole thing was a hoax. <laughs> and that it, it could not bear scrutiny. And he scrutinized it and made it, it could lost its legitimacy. And so they had to restructure the bursary, the, you know, the payments and so on. But having done that and having demonstrated, there was a hurricane soon thereafter. And those students who were on campus, housed in the campus center, in the um, building next door, in the assembly hall. And to my great surprise, Damien organized a group of students. You know he's a chef, you know he was trained, I don't know if, how many of you know that, you only know him as a politician. But he went to, no he went, he's a bona fide trained hotel person. And Damien has, as um, president of the guild, and I hope my president can could probably take a lesson or two from this. He said, I have to feed my, my followers. <laughs> and so he cooked for them. And he invited all of us to come in and watch. And you know, those two things have left an indelible mark on me. So while he was prepared to lock me out of the campus, <laughs> he was also prepared to feed the students who needed his help at a particular critical moment. And so we were able to maintain a level of peace after that between the students. Generally, when they came to me and they protested and came into my office threatening to do what Peter and others had done in the past, to lock in the principal in their office, I was able to say most to them, look, I'm on your side. <laughs> so if you want to demonstrate, fine, I'm with you. But tell us, how can we solve the problems? And before long, uh, the whole concept of student-centeredness, that is how it was built. Respect for their views, 
but most important, addressing their needs. Now, this concept was not new. I did not, although I brought some of it here, but it existed long before I came here. And the person to whom I feel greatly indebted for that was is sitting in the audience, Professor Hamilton. She started it, and I simply carried it on and embellished it here and there. But to, I want to thank you for your initiative in student sentiment. Now, with, if I may, Mr. Stanberry, you are the beneficiary of a building which was designed by your, one of your predecessors, a certain Mr. Falloon. I think he's here somewhere. Yes. Now, may I just take a minute to digress? Mr. Falloon and I were students together. In the same class, we were historians and so on. And you know, in those days, it was a mark of distinction that you were in the history class and so on. So we bonded and we knew each other for a long time. He even visited me, the campus I was at in Long Island, when I was vice president for academic affairs, and I thought everything would be great until I came and I got a letter welcoming me to the campus. But it said something like that, like this. As a registrar, I have to warn you that I am here to protect the rest of the university and that you are not allowed to have too many changes. <laughs> and when it was challenged, and I said, I, I don't disagree with you, show me it in writing. He had a favorite phrase, which was close you down. This is practice. <laughs> this is practice. And you have to follow the traditions of practice. Nonetheless, we work well together because I realized I needed somebody to protect me, you know, from myself, in a sense. But the building came about mostly for a question I asked him, in my naivety, let me be clear. I noticed when there was a negotiation with the UAWU, headed by then Dr. Trevor Monroe, and it was held off site, so to speak, in a building somewhere, and I just couldn't understand it. So I asked him one day, quite naively, and I said, why is this so? And he laughed at me, he said, you have never been to one of these negotiations, have you? They are not negotiations, you know. You are surrounded by the entire UAWU membership, bolstered by tractors in case, and if you, and if they were mindful, they will lift you up on it, on the front. So it could not be held within the precincts of this building. It had to be on a remote part of the campus. And so we as administrators had to trek to that part of the campus. So, wow. But, Later, I, after there were no strikes for about, well, while I was here, happily there were no strikes on this campus, a place that had been known for strikes for years, for the 10 years that I served, because I told the unions, I'm on your side. And I used to have these lunches and I would invite the leadership of the, the unions and they would, and we would go down to what is now the center and we would have lunch and we would have a talk. 
And so after a while, I could walk around anywhere on the campus and I'd be hugged by, you know. That was nice, really. <laughs> Quite see, you know, I, I'm going up to my office and there were two, two ladies in particular who were leaders of the youth. These are the vibrant people who, you know, would say, after a while, we got along so well. So I said, but if these people are behaving like that to me, why should they be in a building next door? And so the planning originated there, but that was not the only reason, as Mr. Stanberry said. Um, one of the few times I think the registrar was actually mad at me was because I shouted at his deputy. And why did I do that? I came here one day at about late evening, and there was still a line all the way out here. What was the purpose? Oh, we're trying to apply to come to the university. I said, how could you have people lining up to apply to come to the university? It just blew my mind, and I just lost it, admittedly. And he said, you know, in a very calm, professional way, he said, well, you know, we have to look at every document. We don't know whether they are forgeries. But my staff can tell that they are not forgeries. And so everybody who applied to the University of the West Indies had to appear in person. Application, or not admission. And so the lines were here, people were here. And so the idea of having a center which would be orderly, which where people would come and there would be, you know, the use of technology and and thanks to thanks to you, Tony, you effected all of those changes. And so this building is really a monument to the student centered concept, but also a monument to the human resource side. Especially and I have for my side it was a UAWU. I have to be honest, because when I heard that you couldn't have a meet a negotiation meeting with a large number of the staff on your campus in a place set out for them, I was just not able to absorb. You know, I'm a, normally a very bright person, but at that time I, I had to be dumb. So. That having been so, so, all of this, the context then was to prepare this university to be a better place, to be a modern institution, and to do all the things that um, Dr. Phillips mentioned. And so, thank you for saying that. So, I did not have to do, you know, a lot of that. But we then had to find a way of living together as a campus. And that for me was the most critical piece. The one disappointment I have, and I said it so I can say it again, was that they did not create a campus center which would have housed all the facilities and allow students and their parents when they come onto the campus to have a place to do. And I still feel that I should say it on my last. After this, I know I won't be invited back. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame them. But I'm not going to pretend that it was not a disappointment. It was a blow to the campus and its stakeholders. Now, this is a public university as you said, Dr. Phillips. Now, where I worked before, which was a large public university, 64 campuses, half a million students, which all from every, from PhD to. So the concept, but one of the things I learned very early was that 
if you spend a dollar over your budget, you're going to jail. It was, there, there was no issue. You, in other words, if you find yourself in jail, it's you. Because if you overspend, this, the regulations were so. so And this was a public, um, thank you, Omar, for not um, um, enforcing those rules. But, <laughs> but as I say that, I say the public university to emphasize that during my tenure, I had unstinting, unconditional support from the government of Jamaica. And at least two, three of the critical persons are in the audience. The Prime Minister who didn't speak to me then because he thought I was from Hanover. You, know, you, speak to, you don't speak to fellow Hanoverians in Kingston, you understand? <laughs> and so, but what I knew was he was a graduate of this university. And so he kept I am told, kept a very close eye on things like, for example, when the Kentucky Fried Chicken was going up, I am, I am, I am told that he inquired if I had lost my mind, but <laughs> not in so many words, but. So I knew he was there for this university. The other two persons was the Minister of Education, Virgil Whiteman. And we worked out a pact. There's nothing that happens on this campus which you should not be the first to know. So we had to build trust between the university. And so we would meet once a month for breakfast at 7.30 in the morning and that could take place anywhere, upstairs, elsewhere, to lay out what the university needs were, and so on. But most of the times, when I made a request, he would refer me to the Minister of Finance. And that Minister of Finance was then, Peter, you, I escaped your, I escaped your tenure. <laughs> Which is Dr. Omar Davis, who had a view about public expenditure. Uh, and the one thing that I'll never forget, the, there are many, but one of the things, we used to get our allocation about July even though the budget was approved in April. So between July and April, there's usually a fair amount, fair arrears. So the first time I went, he asked me, and so what are you going to do with the money? Said, well, this money has been allocated to us. Why? And he said, no. I still have the money, and we have to account for it. And that is how most of these buildings, for which I have given credit, was built. It was from the arrears of the government of Jamaica. So every time I went to the meeting, I had a list of buildings, I had a list of projects, and in some cases, overexpended what we were supposed to have. But he gave me exactly what we were owed and said, no, I need a report on how it was spent. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I feel indebted to Dr. Davis, uh, Mr. Patterson, Mr. Whiteman for the unstinting support. I spent most of my principal, where is the principal? I spent a fair amount of my time at Hero Circle, and I would advise you <laughs> to do the same. It has benefits, it has benefits. For example, 
One day, I got a note, I got some information that JPS was going to lock off the power on the campus for because we had not paid our bills. And that was not exactly a small bill, as you can imagine. There was no money to pay. So I trekked down to here a circle. And one of the really influential persons in this country, but you don't, if you are not in her circle, you wouldn't know, was Miss Tyndale. And her twin sister, Daisy Coke. If you don't know those two persons at that period, you're not getting any place. And so I went down with all humility, hoping that she would, you know, be supportive. And to my great surprise, she just looked and said, so you can't close the university. Picked up her phone, called JPS, and said, you can't close the university. I'm sorry. If need be, the government will assume the costs of it until we work it out. Ms. Tyndale, you can never imagine what that meant to me personally and to this campus. It was really <laughs> one of those, one of those impromptu, because she didn't even know I was coming. I just turned up at her office, you know. But, so then the short story is, if I were you, I'd spend a little more time at Hero Circle. <laughs> and with the right people. Now, I have said enough to indicate that my tenure here was really about the assistance I got from my f staff, from all of the pe persons who work on the campus, and, and they are some who have passed on, but I think I've seen a, the deans, for example, were, well, four of them, three of them have no passed, but Joe, you're still the only surviving dean, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Joe. Joe was a senior dean, by the way, and Joe survived. And, but they were really towers of strength. They supported the academic programs. The only thing I disagreed with Joe once, I was, we were supposed to be having a negotiation between management and the union. And I expected Joe as dean to be on my side. I arrived in the room and Mr. Pereira was sitting with the union negotiating with the administration of which he was a part. <laughs> so, but the whole point was that, you know, we had moments that, but as a group, they were really supportive. And um, I think I, I, these lights are really not so good for my eyes. But I, is that Mrs. Mark Morris? Yes, Mrs. McMorris, and I, and I had invited um, Mrs. Morgan, is she here? Because Dr. Morgan and Dr. McMorris were two exemplary colleagues who I worked with and their past, but their legacy in terms of how to, because it's, and the other was Barry Chavans. And I like Barry Chavans as, because, you know, he had this sort of messiah image. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the, the only thing I enjoyed about graduation, which when Barry went up and the entire group stood up to pay homage to him. You know, it, it, it's... It's something you don't easily forget, but they were critical. 
in all of this. And there are others in the room who I have to say, but assume that you are mentioned. Devon, you are one of those. Where is he? He's now <laughs> one of my, one of the many things that are rather, shall I say, the central thing about my life is to watch people develop over time and watch them emerge and watch them take charge of things. That gives me immense satisfaction. So I mentioned Devon, who is now the S, what is he? What are you called now, Devon? <laughs> the estate manager? No. You want to call it, No. I will call it the Lord of the Manor. <laughs> I think it's so not uh, but for a long time, Devon was the, um, you know, he had just joined it and so forth, and we would walk around the campus, and, and I said, Devon, you know, this campus, this is a tropical country. We must have green plants around, around the campus, and so, you know, we had to decorate, and so I know that I, I know he has not only earned his doctorate, but has gone on to become in charge of the manor. Devon, you did, thank you for your help all these years, and thanks so much. And finally, let me come to the, the real reason I am here, and part of it is to say thank you to so many people, but to give credit to just a few. My wife, who um, does not allow me to do anything. You know, it's great, Rima, thank you. <laughs> you, you, you. You know, my alter ego. We don't, have, we don't even have to agree on anything, but we know, you know, she will pay, and her sister, who sort of, Dr. Cobham, and it, and Mr. Well, I said Mr. Cobham. In this case, um, Jeff is a very important person on this campus, so you treat him with due respect because he. But those are parts of my family. Now I am from a fairly large family, personally, and there are six of us. But this evening, I was only able to get one uh, other person to be here, and that is my sister, Lorna Holness, sitting in the front. My brother, who has been my friend and mentor for years, was not able to come, but he's represented by my nephew, friend, and sometimes advisor on certain aspects of business and so on. Howard Hall and his, and his daughter, who are both here, to represent that side of the family. Oren is supposed to be here, but I can't. He's here? Oh, Oren. Oren and Mrs. Hall representing the extended family. You represent all 500 of those who are not here, um, here and abroad. And so, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bishop, Archbishop, I left you for last, because you, <laughs> would you believe that Archbishop used to be a, on the, what is it, academic board, and years after he had learned so much and became archbishop, he said, I used to learn a lot from you, you know. <laughs> and so while I thought I was the one learning from, from the uh, clergy, he said, oh, I learned a lot from you, you know, how to manage cantankerous people. <laughs> And so I am delighted that you're able to come, Archbishop. And 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've said enough. Over to you, sir. And thank you again for everything. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much, Sir Ken. Just want to assure you that the principal will make the student center his legacy. Let us clap for that, Principal Denzel. So ladies and gentlemen, we have, we're almost at the end. We're going to do the unveiling of the sign. But let me just quickly thank all who are responsible or who are responsible for this function. Devon Smith and his team, Dr. Devon Smith from EMD, the MITS team. Just want to mention that all of this function from the start has been on YouTube Live and will be there um, for posterity, those of you who want to go back and look. And some of our important guests are online, like my predecessor, Dr. Bill Hutchinson, former principal, uh, Professor Leah Ryan, I understand, also online. And I gather that Professor Kawa, former deputy principal, has joined after I gave the introductions. So we want to thank uh, Mitz for that and Markham for arranging uh, this function along with Dr. Burke and her, theme, her team, rather. Office of the Principal, my office, Ms. Norma Christie, graphic designer. Office of Community Outreach, the bursary, who make sure that everything is in place and that we are fed after this. Uh, Sigmund Anderson, uh, Gillian Scarlett, etc., etc., and all of you for you for coming and for I know that at this time we have to compete very heavy, heavily for the um, the plethora of Christmas parties and functions that you were able to come and stay, although you have not yet been fed. Um, it shows enormous respect for Sir Ken. Thank you all very much for coming. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this function, and we regard this as an important part of our 75th anniversary celebration, to celebrate those who, through their labor and contribution and vision, have made the University of the West Indies what it is. And clearly, Sir Kenneth Hall is one of them. And so we're going to move over to where the sign is. We're going to invite Sir Kenneth and Lady Hall, Minister Smith, Principal, Dr. Phillips and myself to do the unveiling. And then we will join um, in some refreshments uh, thereafter. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a wonderful function, and God bless you all.